All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming in. Um, we're talking about using desired state configuration in Azure today. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Will Anderson. I'm a Microsoft Cloud and Data Center Management MVP with a focus on PowerShell. Uh, I'm also an honorary scripting guy, so sometimes you might see me blogging over on Hey Scripting Guy. I did a seven-part series on DBSC. Uh, I also work on the board of directors for the DevOps Collective and the webmaster at PowerShell.org. So if you know you can't get your password reset or you want to start blogging or anything like that on the site, um, webmaster at comes over to me. Uh, also recently co-authored Master PowerShell Tricks Volume 2. It's out on Amazon, Seamus Plug. And I am a security patch management and compliance SME. So um, my primary focus the last couple of years has been dealing with managing and maintaining configuration management and compliance in the Azure space, uh, primarily with IaaS. So I do a ton of DSC in Azure. So we're going to be talking about that today. So challenges of compliance. Um, Primarily, organizations, you know, uh, I'm finding like especially large uh, companies have been kind of doing the shadow IT thing with Azure and, you know, kind of going ahead and building out infrastructure on their own uh, without IT getting a hold of it, especially uh, in the case of IaaS environments. And the problem with the IaaS environments that are typically given, you know, spun up by developers or non-IT people is that they don't necessarily conform to corporate controls. So it might not be, you know, the approved company image. That image doesn't have like all of the, you know, settings and permissions and stuff necessary to to be in corporate compliance standards. And then, you know, when it comes down to audit time and auditors start, you know, waving the flags at these people, oftentimes it's the IT department that kind of gets left holding the bag. And next thing you know, they're having to kind of scramble and pick up and, you know, trying to struggle with getting these things to be compliant without necessarily tearing down the environment, rebuilding it. That's where Azure Automation DSC comes into play. So the, the cool thing is, like, how many people are using uh, Azure or using DSC in the office space now? Awesome. <laughs> the, well, the, the cool thing about it, though, is that, you know, it, you can actually use a lot of the DSC configurations that you're using already in your environment to retroactively bring those systems that you have into Azure in, into compliance. So, you know, it's, it's basically just a matter of getting those configurations published and then getting the endpoints to, to register and talk to them. That's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be, um, you know, I'm going to kind of show you some of the hoops that you have to go through in order to be able to get a configuration, maybe some of your custom modules published to Azure, and then also, you know, go through some of the hoops of, um, you know, dealing with, uh, like, you know, getting the, the configurations published and um, compiled, and then getting those client nodes, both Azure Resource Manager and ASM, uh, you know, talking to your Azure endpoint. So we're going to be going through that today. Code time. What's that? Oh, it did it again. All right, let me see if I can get the display to flip back to my desktop again. I, mean, I didn't hallucinate that earlier. We, we actually had it duplicated. Oh, righty. Also, thank you. So um, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just kind of run through a quick demo here of, um, you know, uh, getting... Uh, the access to the Azure Automation account, and then you know, comp you know, uploading the, the configuration and modules, compiling the MOF files to be deployed, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, I've already logged. Well, I'm just going to do it for the sake of doing it. So, obviously, first thing you need to do is you need to log in with your credentials. Um, credentials.
And then, yeah, of course, you need to get to your target subscription by setting yourself into the appropriate context. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then target your resource group. Now, you're going to see in a lot of the code, and I'm actually going to make this available on my GitHub repo. So just go to GitHub, Gamer Living Will, that's me. Um, you're going to see me casting a lot of these commands to uh, variables. It's because you really use a lot of the object properties over and over and over, and I hate typing. So uh, I kind of recommend that you go ahead and do the same thing. But we're going to go ahead and snag the resource group that the uh, automation account is actually in, which you can see here. Um, and the automation account uh, basically gives you access to a number of different uh, objects. Uh, you can store your run books in it. Uh, it measures the or monitors the number of hybrid workers, which are basically VMs that you can put into your data center to kind of issue marching orders from Azure into the data center from. We'll talk a lot about that a little bit more later. Uh, but you also uh, have access to a uh, number of modules. You can even directly import modules from um, uh, the PowerShell gallery. Um, we'll talk about some of the, the potential limitations there. But also, you get some really good monitoring. We're going to get a little bit deeper into that in a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and snag the Azure Automation account. You can kind of see some of the information here that you get straight off of the bat. Uh, another thing that you have to, to take into consideration, and this is why I share a lot of my code, is that um, in order to be able to directly upload your own custom modules into the Azure environment, you can't just publish it straight to the, the modules um, uh, object in or object store in Azure. You actually have to first upload it to a cloud location, and then from that cloud lo location, you can move it into Azure. There's a little bit of trickery with that. Uh, I'm we'll get into that a little bit deeper here in just a second. But of course, the first thing that we like to do is we want to go ahead and zip up our module. So we do that. Uh, I'm actually going to take out the networking zip though because I have the wrong version in my directory. So, what was that? Yeah, you can go away. All right. So here's where the trickery kind of comes into play, is that um, in order to, so I've got a storage account, and we're going to go ahead and just get the blob store that I have already created there. Um, once you've acquired that, which you can see that here, um, we have to do a little bit of trickery with the Azure RM and SM commandlets in order to be able to manipulate the blob store. There are actually no blob store commandlets for Azure RM. So what you wind up having to do is you actually have to log into Azure SM, uh, put yourself into the context of the same subscription that the blob store exists in. Then with your Azure RM creds, you have to get the storage account key and using the account key, you can apply it to the storage context in the ASM. Now, that might be a little bit hard to follow because it sounds confusing. It is, uh, which is why I share my code on this, because I spent many, many, many hours banging my head on it. I have no idea. Um, I know that there are some changes coming in the future as far as the Azure commandlets, whether or not they add new ones to be able to kind of not have to do this, I don't know. So hopefully we'll find out soon. Once we get the storage context, uh, which includes the information that we've grabbed, actually I'll just go ahead and show you by committing these two lines, and then you'll see Hopefully it works. Um, you'll go ahead and see here the storage key. Then we go ahead and pass that to our storage context uh, through the storage key value. So we'll go ahead and execute that. And then you can see now we have our Azure SM storage context, which basically just says, you know what, use the storage key to access these storage tables using SM. Um, 
And then we can go ahead and look at the container directly. And then from there, we can go ahead and publish the modules that we've just zipped up um, up to that storage blob and then move it from that storage blob, which you can see the blob iCloud URI here. Um, and then it'll go ahead, upload it to the blob store, and then move it over. Now, currently I'm using, um, I'm using a public blob, which means that these modules are publicly readable and accessible. You can use a storage or a secure blob. Uh, however, you have to start doing some stuff with SAS tokens. That's a whole nother layer of not fun. So for the sake of the demos, I just do this and be done with it. Um, but I highly re recommend that if you are in fact, you know, using like company proprietary modules, you want to go the secure blob route. Uh, there are some articles out there on retrieving the SAS tokens and how you need to compile the strings in order to be able to leverage that um, as the URI. But uh, like I said, for simplicity's sake, I'm just not doing it in here. Um, so we've gone ahead and we've uploaded our uh, modules and then we've gone ahead and put them up into our um, automation account. So what we need to do is now is we need to get our uh, configuration file up there, which I'll go ahead and just so you can see that I'm not doing any voodoo magic here, uh, we'll just go ahead and take a look. And this is actually um, the, the same configuration that I use for a lot of my demos regarding DSC and stuff, so nothing's really changed there. Um, but basically it is a full configuration, essentially what it's going to do is it's going to take uh, the server, the target server, it's going to remove the UI, it's going to put in a couple of files, uh, a couple of firewall rules and stuff like that. So we're going to go ahead and bounce that up there. And what I'm doing here with the get Azure automation BSE configuration is that it's just going ahead and telling me that uh, I have in fact published it. Uh, that is a result of the published uh, parameter up in import Azure Automation DSE configuration. Um, it, the names do get a little bit long here too, so I apologize. Um, so once we've gone ahead and imported the configuration, and you can actually see it. I missed it. Take that piece. You can see it here. Uh, you can also see that I've previously compiled the job a couple of times over, so you know, it's, you know, basically I'm just kind of forcing a recompilation uh, now. But you have to go ahead and compile the job, and then it takes a couple of minutes for all of that to go through. And you can see here once again uh, why I cast this stuff to variables is because, you know, you're using it repetitively. So highly, highly, highly recommend doing it. So we're going to go ahead, fire that up, hopefully it won't error out. So you can see I've got a new status uh, and no return as of yet. So it takes a couple of minutes for the, the compiling to happen. Um, if we go back to our web display here, you will see that a new compilation job is in fact here usually takes no longer than five to ten minutes. Um, if it stays in a queued status longer than that, more than likely something went wrong, uh, you might want to start trying to compile that moth locally just to see if there's any kind of an error de you know, in dealing with that. Um, you, you will see an error status. If you uh, hit the compilation job, you'll actually get some monitoring on it. If it's a hard fail, it'll come up into errors. Uh, sometimes it takes a while for those errors to display, though. Uh, usually, like I said, if it's taking more than about 10 minutes, you kind of want to, you know, get in, you know, take a look at your moth file locally just to see if you can compile it. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you guys have ever, um, 
uh, compile them off without actually calling out the PS desired state configuration module in your import DSC resources or DSC resources. Um, you'll get that error here. Uh, it's not a big deal. It's just you didn't call it out, so it's freaking out. Uh, since it's the default module, I, I don't tend to worry about it. Um, and then uh, you also tend to, yeah, this this is that PS desired state configuration one. So, you know, oh well, too bad, so sad. Um, you can also take a look and see your configuration using the configuration or source snapshot. Uh, this is kind of a nice way that, you know, if a coworker or somebody has uploaded a configuration, you're not sure what it does, you can just go ahead and click on it, review the code, see exactly what it's doing, and then decide if you want to use it or not. Alright, so you can see it's in a starting status right now, and we're going to go ahead and move along while it does that. Can you guys see the code okay in the back? What about the website? Is it a little bit tough to read or is it okay? Is that readable? Awesome. So now what we need to do is we need to register our target VM. Um, now the code that I'm about to show you is specifically for Azure RM. There's some cardinal differences in how Azure SM is handled and I'll go through that in, uh, shortly. But uh, we go ahead and get our VM object. And then we want to go ahead and use the RM Automation DSC node configuration uh, commandlet to pick up um, the, the config that we want to dial into it. Now, you're going to notice here that I'm looking for one where the PS item dot name is not like meta. Um, I have a habit of embedding the DSC local configuration manager class in my configs, uh, or at least in my master configs to make sure that the LCM is actually configured the way I want it to be. Uh, what happens in Azure is that as a result when it compiles, much like when you do it locally, it creates a moth file and a meta moth file. Uh, so you're going to get two moth files with like names, so you need to, to make sure that you're not grabbing the meta. Um, and then, of course, the, the name of the, the particular configuration. So we're going to get that, and then for the sake of not having any headaches, I decided to go ahead and splat out my parameters so we didn't get the 3 million mile long characters. Um, so the, the really cool thing that I like about uh, the Azure Automation DSC command links is you can actually configure the LCM directly uh, through the parameter sets. So you can see here I've got configuration mode set for auto apply and correct, reboot mode if needed true, uh, allow module overwrite. Uh, this is one that I really, really, really recommend that you have in there. Uh, if you're doing any side by side or if you have uh, say something published in the uh, repository or multiple versions you want to go ahead and kind of make sure that's set. I've actually had conflicting modules or module versions before when I did the deployment. Uh, action after reboot, of course, continue configuration, but you also get you have to specify automation account name and resource group name. So we're going to go ahead and commit that and register our node. Now, I do have to say, uh, it does take a couple of minutes for it to register, and it's not going to return until it gives a success or fail. Uh, however, in recent iterations of the extension, it's actually, they've made some improvements. Um, previously, in earlier versions of the extension, it would actually hold it open until the configuration itself completed, which, I don't know about you guys, but I've written some insanely long configurations, and that's not very fun to wait for your session to stay open. Um, they've also kind of done a couple of uh, new things that I thought were interesting, was that the return now that you get is very much like a return when you do an Azure template deployment. So it'll actually review the values for your parameters um, and gives you some additional information that I think is kind of cool. So we're going to go ahead and let this uh, bake for a couple of minutes, and you will see, oh, one moment, uh, 
that it has not appeared yet, so I just like, nope, nope, I think that's it. Yes. Yes. Pardon me? I'm just doing this to a single VM right now. Um, I actually haven't played it with it with scale sets yet. Uh, that would be kind of an interesting exercise to see how it works. It does not. That's good to know. Um, typically, the the environments that I'm pushing out are pretty well fixed as far as like you know already designed in scalability and stuff. Uh, anything that's really requires like any level of scalability, I'm finding that developers are using more containers and web apps as opposed to traditional IaaS. Uh, traditional IaaS is pretty much being used more for legacy monolithic apps. So I haven't had the unfortunate uh, run in with auto scale sets, but thank you for letting me know that. And now I know. Uh, you can see here the the output, and like I said, it's very very similar to what you get when you do a uh, Azure template deployment. So it kind of gives you the uh, link to the template as well, so you can see what template it used when it applied the uh, extension, and then also your parameters and their associated values. Um, and then you know from here, you, you also have the ability. You, you also have outputs. Um, I haven't gotten the answer back yet, but I'm kind, of, I'm kind of waiting to see if you can get custom outputs because one of the things that I would be interested in is not just the uh, registration URL of the DSC node, but also, you know, maybe like what key it's using when it registers. Uh, that might be some, you know, useful information to be able to get dumped directly out of it. Um, then, of course, if you want to take a look and see what the DSC extension status is, you can go ahead and, um, you know, run get Azure RMDM DSC extension status. A really cool thing that I like about this is you have the DSC configuration log. Now, this is not going to give you the full log of the entire configuration. This is going to give you the DSC meta configuration. It's going to give you the registration results anything you need in order to be able to troubleshoot the extension itself. The reason why you're not getting the actual DSC logs is because hopefully they will be shipped up to your DSC, uh, your Azure Automation DSC reporting, and then you can pull it out of there. Now, here's where the cool part comes in. And so you guys aren't really doing any DSC on time, right? You are. Are you doing pull server? What do you think of the reporting? Yeah. Well, it's available. You just have to write your own tools, um, which makes it really fun. But the cool thing is, is that with Azure Automation DSC, you get reporting through a UI because managers love UIs. Uh, and you can see this one is failing all over the place. But the cool thing is, is that we can actually drill down and I can see that X firewall failed with an error. Um, I actually had this one going earlier, so you'll see that I actually have compliancy statuses. And like if I go drill down to a failed one, it'll actually tell you what, um, what DSC resource provider it failed on. Furthermore, you can even drill down even further because I use Windows feature a lot, so I want to know exactly which one it failed on. It's going to tell me which one it, it called out and blew up. So I look at .NET Core, and it's going to say, through one or more non-terminating errors, blah, 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 blah. That's actually a typical issue with .NET Core when you're doing Windows feature, by the way. If you reboot the box, uh, it'll actually successfully install it and then keep on coming. Um, but you can also see which ones are compliant. So I now have my no SMS on drive file uh, on the, the drives that I've specified. Um, and then X firewall, it's like, well, wait a second, you know, you, you've got all these rules here, why am I not compliant? And you start drilling into it, and it's like, oh, wait a second, it's dependent on RSAT. Well, what's wrong with RSAT? 
Oh, it's dependent on its RSAT, which is dependent on IIS, which is dependent on core. And you can continue to drill down until you see, oh, it's waiting on these five things before it actually tags that, that failed resource. Okay, cool, huh? It, you you want to try to build the tools for that? So um, it, and that's kind of the, the basics of the reporting. The, the cool thing is, is that you, know, you get this really nice dashboard that tells you all of your registered nodes, tells you what their status is, and then gives you the ability to drill down and see what's going on. The other thing that I also prefer to do too, uh, so I don't have to drill into subscriptions, is that you can actually, using OMS, ship your DSC logs uh, to OMS and then build some dashboarding and reporting out of there. Uh, part of the reason that I do that is that um, you, you can kind of attack this one of two ways and it depends on how much money you want to spend. So um, Azure DSC is free for five nodes. So if you have more than five nodes assigned to Azure Automation DSC in a subscription, it starts charging you. Uh, I looked this morning um, because I usually do US dollars, so I wanted to find out how much it was in euros. It's about five dollars or five euro per month uh, per node uh, once you get over five nodes. So what I find is companies tackle this one of two ways. Either they keep the Azure Automation DSC account uh, in the subscription with the nodes that they're managing, which the really cool part is that if that's the case, uh, your admins who know absolutely nothing about PowerShell can go through the UI and actually point and clicky to machines that they want to add. Um, they, but you know, companies kind of I've seen them do this because they might have like 300 subscriptions and none of their subscriptions actually have more than four or five nodes in it. So they're going the free route and they're just milking it for what they can. Other ones want a single subscription for their IT department to be able to do their monitoring from. So what they'll do is they'll instead, you know, regardless of what subscription their machines are in, they'll register it to a DSC node or a DSC endpoint uh, in a single subscription so they can get it and they just pay the five bucks per month per node or whatever they've agreed with with their Microsoft uh, you know, sales guy. So you can go a couple of different routes with it. Um, but it's important to, to realize that you know, once you get over that five, five nodes, there is a potential cost there. Um, anyway, let's go ahead and see where our box is. And you can see it's in a failed state right now. Uh, is that the, yeah, that's the right one. So we go ahead, drill in, and we find out that it's bombing out on disk size. Um, this is because I'm really bad at writing resources on the fly. Uh, so it's just a really badly written uh, resource. It's going to probably reboot and come back. Um, but yeah, it, so the, the cool thing is it gives me the ability, though, to kind of show you that you know, you, the differentiation between compliant resources, failed, and not compliant. Uh, not compliant just means that it's not in the desired state. Uh, so if you're expecting IIS to be installed and it's not, it'll be not non-compliant. If it's failed, it's probably because it blew up on something, like this one through a non-terminating error. Um, and the, the reason why the disk size one actually throws a non-terminating error is because I shrink the original C drive and then I go ahead and format the, the remaining partition and give it a new drive letter. And I don't have any good timing in there between the time that it's shrunk down, uh, the new disk is formatted and it tries to apply um, all of the stuff. So really good at talking about DSC, really bad about re writing good resources. Oh, come on, that was fun. All right, so ASM. Uh, ASM's handled a little bit different. Um, it, primarily the, the steps as far as like everything that we talked about, about getting your modules and stuff like that, you're using all Azure RM. That lives completely in Azure RM. The only difference is the method in which you're registering a node. So for example, 
um, we're going to go ahead and grab some of the, the information that, that we did previously. So I need the resource group. I need the automation account that I'm going to be registering against. I need the configuration. Um, now, and then also I need to get the registration information from the Azure automation account. So I'm going to go ahead and commit this. And we'll go ahead and run this line and see what this looks like. It's not a lot here, um, but you can see that I've got the endpoint URI, and then I've got my registration keys here. Um, all I can say is that if you try the primary key and it fails, go ahead and try the secondary key. Uh, I find that with this and OMS, uh, it seems that it seems to want to look for a like one of the specific keys, but it never really specifies which one it's looking for. So uh, that would be the first time, first thing I would try if you get a registration error. That you tried one key, try the other, and see if it works. So we're going to go ahead and grab our ASM VM, and just so you know, I'm not pulling any uh, magic tricks here. We're going to go ahead and take a look at that VM. And you'll see no extensions are currently installed. Now, some of the information that you need here, um, well, it, you need to compile significantly more information. It also requires that it be compiled into a JSON object. So this is what you're seeing here. You see the modules URI? Uh, the configuration function is actually, uh, or the modules URI is actually something that Microsoft has published, uh, which gives you the uh, registration. It's basically a script to help you register an SMVM. Um, then you need your registration endpoint, which is your DSE nodes uh, URI. Um, one thing that I will tell you is that the node configuration name needs to be the name of the configuration dot node name. Now, I highly recommend that when you're publishing configurations to Azure, use localhost um, because it's going to run it in the context of localhost or it's going to start looking for that computer name. Um, the, the modern day wisdom of building configs uh, as of late has been use localhost in the node name to give you a little bit more uh, flexibility because then your configurations are not computer name dependent. Um, but the, you know, when you specify a node configuration name, you do need to concatenate that into configuration name dot computer name or localhost in this instance. Um, and then you also need to come up with private configuration, which is another JSON object, and that's just to pass the secondary key, which we're looking at in plain text right here. So I'm going to go ahead and cast those. Once again, I love splatting. So, um, you know, we're going to go ahead and splat this to a variable, and then we're going to go ahead and pass that as our parameter set. Now, our target deploy, we executed a little bit earlier, um, and this is basically the VM object. Now, if you're doing multiple VMs, which this actually does do a really good job of handling things at scale, um, you want to make sure that you're for eaching it. You can't array it. It will freak out. I also noticed, too, that uh, does anybody use uh, where or for each as a method? Okay, where object, even if you pull one object, it still treats it as an array. Um, and this has a ten the set Azure VM extension has a tendency to freak out on the object that you're passing to it. So you're going to have to like spec specify zero in square brackets or whatever in order to be able to do it. Or for each it, um, and then pass each one in the array individually. So we've got that. We're going to go ahead and update the Azure VM, which is something that you have to do anytime that you make a change to a uh, ASM VM. And you'll see that it's going ahead and kicking off. And hopefully my code didn't break. Questions so far? Pretty cool so far? 
And we're just deploying VMs left, right, and center and getting them configured. It's it's like five minutes of work. Um, a, a client of mine wanted to actually start implementing this at scale. And uh, basically what I did was I wrote a script to grab all the VMs in a resource group and just start shoveling them in. And yeah, all of their machines just started popping up into compliance. It was awesome. Shoot. Uh, no, because uh, my subscription actually limits me to 16 cores. Uh, so I have a max of four machines. I keep two already previously spun up as a backup. Um, so for reaching two is kind of boring. Uh, plus, I also try to keep an ASM and an ARM box to be able to, to bounce up there. So for reaching between ASM and ARM would be kind of kludgy. Um, really, like I said, I'm posting this code to my GitHub, so just gamer living will, uh, and yeah, it'll, you know, you, you'll be able to kind of take the, the code that I'm giving you and put it into a for each loop pretty easily. So it's saying it succeeded, so we're going to go back to our nice starry night. I don't know what I just opened, but okay. And we'll see. There's an extension there. Yay. All right, so we're going to go ahead and bounce in here, and you're going to get a detailed status, and it's probably not going to come up with anything right yet. Um, the other thing that you can do, I didn't put it in here. So we need, how much time do we have? Service name. Uh, we can go ahead and monitor what the extension status is, and you can see the DSC configuration was applied successfully. Uh, it's once again referring to the meta config here, uh, but if we go ahead and parenthesize that and go to DSC configuration line, we can view line by line what the status is. So the extension has, in fact, been uh, su completed successfully. And then all we have to do is just go back to our automation account. I was actually kind of waiting for, for um, Alexander to come in here because uh, I mentioned that I'm hardly ever in the UI, and he called me out on that yesterday. Um, and... I really am hardly ever in the UI, but then I realized today I had a demo where I had to be in the UI. So, kind of waiting for him to poke his head in and be like, aha! So, uh, one other thing that you, uh, I have to mention too is that on the initial config, when it first registers the node, it's going to come into a compliant status. Uh, my understanding is that it's because it set the meta configuration and the meta configuration returned compliant. However, shortly after that, you'll see it go into a failed status, and that is because it started it, you know, went it through the configuration, realized it's in false, and needed to get fixed. So after a little while, you'll be able to get reporting. Generally, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes before you start getting reporting. Um, but, you know, like I said, it's, you know, not that big of a deal. Uh, it, you know, it, you can kind of wait it out. You'll know pretty pretty easily uh, if something goes into a failure state really quick when you're doing the BMDSC extension status stuff. Now, how do we know that that configuration has been applied? Well, I'll tell you how. Uh, I don't like the UI on my servers, so the first thing I do is I remove the, the UI. I do keep the UI management tools, though, um, because my configuration is designed for prepping SCCM distribution points. I actually found out uh, rather violently that uh, there is a service that SCCM distribution points are dependent on that have to have the UI management tools installed. It's a, it's a component called remote differential compression. Um, I found this out 
uh, because the first time I deployed the configuration, which was actually based off of a PowerShell script that I had written, um, the server was going into a continuous reboot like every 30 seconds. Um, because what it would do is it would uninstall the UI management tools like I asked it to, then find the RDC component was uninstalled. So it would install the RDC component, which needed the UI management tools and install those, and then reboot the box. Then it would see the UI management tools were installed, uninstall it, which would remove RDC. So it was, uh, it was pretty fun. And now, here you see, no UI, just management tools. And if I do GCI, uh, can, can you guys actually see that? That's, that is awful. Oh, actually, I have the UI management tools installed. So you'll see here. I have my no SMS on drive file. Cool. Awesome. So uh, just a couple words of note uh, before we get going out of here. Uh, number one, well, first off, I know that Ken Hansen and Angel had a talk going on this hour, so thank you for skipping that or just not telling me that the room was full and we had no, no other choice. Um, number two, um, you can actually use Azure DSC to manage boxes in Azure, AWS, uh, your own data center, uh, pretty much anywhere. There is a uh, article that talks about this uh, for onboarding machines in Azure Automation DSC. There are a lot of different scenarios here that I didn't have time to cover today. I highly recommend that you take a look through it. Um, the, the, but like I said, the cool part is, is that you can manage your data center boxes and get reporting and not have to build your own reporting tools. Um, so like from a compliance and config management perspective, this is awesome. So I highly recommend that you take a look and, uh, yeah, thanks for coming.